I'll order the meeting of the Montpelier Roxbury Board of School Directors at 6.41 p.m. Um, first order of public comment. Seeing and hearing none, we can go to uh, consent agenda. Uh, do I have uh, a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Uh, Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Um, I'm assuming we didn't drag Hope and I, out here. I honestly asked, wrote them an email to ask if they needed a ride up here and never heard a response from them. Okay. So. Um, I know there's lots of things going on right now in student lives in, in terms of college acceptance and all that kind of stuff and probably other pressures on them at the moment but I did not hear back from them well we will give them an excused absence on <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, let me just plug this in um, and so, I know also yeah. Mike was off today so you're going to yeah. fill in for Mike on language immersion so why don't we I'm going to do the best I can yeah. so Ooh, there's my lovely family. It's not what, was, not what you all need to see right now, though. It's a sausage house. Mm -hmm. Mustard. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> my husband doesn't usually look like that, I promise. <laughs> I think we, we might have guessed that. Well. And, uh, so this. Talk about it there. Yeah. Oh, if you, there's if mirror. you mirror it right there, it should run through for you. Teamwork there you go. in action. Thank you, Benjamin. Right. Okay. So um, these are Mike's slides, so I do not want to take any credit or think that I am any kind of expert in this. He is much better versed at presenting around the language immersion program, having more experience <coughs> than I. Um, but like Jim said, he is having some things going on right now and is at work, it wasn't at work. So we are. Uh, we're taking it on for them. So if there's additional questions, then I will, I'll have Heather write them down and we'll get the answers to you and I'll do the best I can tonight. Um, but this is very quick. Um, so just uh, looking at why immersion in your board packet, you also got a white paper before I start on this. That was written by Jen Botsajern, who's a current superintendent in Orange. Um, and what she wrote that as the director of curriculum for Chittenden East when she was there. So Mike had taken over for her, so therefore took over the foreign and like the language immersion program um, and getting it in place. But Jen is the reason it starts, and I want to make sure that she gets credit for writing that white paper. Um, so that this is all in that paper. If you had a chance to look at it, it's pretty researchy, and I understand that. Um, why immersion bilingualism is so very important, as is biliteracy. As a former international school teacher myself. Um, with tons of bilingualism in that environment, as well as a teacher from an inner city school that had a whole lot of Spanish and English. I can attest to the importance of bilingualism, and it's one of, I think, a knock on American education that we don't have more of it, quite honestly. So um, that piece, there's also biliteracy, which is huge. Um, academic achievement, as you saw in the white paper and in some of the other research, there is a proven, there's a plenty of evidence around increased achievement with, with students who are bilingual over time. Um, Sociocultural competence, global competitiveness and communication, all of these things are quite important and important to this board and important to our community as well. Um, and bilingualism can help that in immersion. So the purpose of the study that we're proposing in this particular budget um, would do the, this work. It's working with a certain company who does this, as Mike mentioned in the last board meeting, and it's, it has these seven um, pillars that it stands on. So throughout the study, it helps the committee go through, whoever's studying it with you, go through each one of those seven pillars. It also has rubrics that are attached to each one of those pillars so that we know where we are and what the next step will always be. Um, so it helps us really dive deep into the necessary thinking that needs to happen in order to put a program such as this in place. Um, they're experts, they've done it in plenty of places, uh, that, and they have evidence that they've worked. So that's part of what the study will do. It will address those seven components pretty hardcore. Um, we, would, we wouldn't do this as an administration decision. We'd have a committee. 
obviously um, a group of people who are stakeholders um, and any decision that's made is done through this committee, not through administrative ones. And that, that committee will be responsible for generating questions to investigate, visit research, and report. And this vis visit is in there because we think it's important to go to other places who currently have immersion programs to see how they're doing and talk to the people on staff around that. We have Jericho Elementary right, right now who's, got, who's in year two. Richmond Elementary would be starting at a very similar time we, were, we are because they're starting a new one. So we have some local places, but we also have some places in Massachusetts that we could rely on, which not, is not very far far haul from here. Um, things that we don't know about is we have no idea what language because that's a committee decision. We have no idea about the location. We have two elementary schools. Which one would it make the most sense of? The committee would have to really dive into that. Um, the staffing, we haven't talked in depth about that. We just don't know the answers to that. This study would help us find the answers to those, those kind of things. Um, I'm going to send you these quick slides afterwards only for these links right here. It has the link to the white paper, but also the foreign language brief, which was written by John Albergini, who's the superintendent over at CESU, and Mike. And the what, reason why I like it, you don't have it. Do you have any, you do have your yes, materials now. Take a look at that, because I thought that I had not seen that before. I looked through the board packet. Um, Mike hadn't shown that to me before. So looking at those questions were very similar questions to ones that the board raised last month or last board meeting. And you have three separate school systems who are in the thick of it answering that, those questions. Um, and they were asked very specifically by John and Mike. They were, they're not just general questions. So I thought that was, that was great. And you can see what um, CESU is doing right now. But that's really what Mike had planned. And then he was going to talk about his experience in bringing about the program. But I can't speak to that. All I can speak about is from a parent who lives in Jericho whose kid couldn't participate because <laughs> she's too old. So I can only tell you what the feel of it is at Jericho and that it's not separate from any of the other classes um, and that it's part of the school. And when I go listen to concerts, the kids sing in Spanish. <laughs> um, and it's, it's, that's just the way it is and everybody else stops along. <laughs> so that's my only experience with it. I can't really answer anything more than that. Go ahead, Steve. I, I would, I, this is a question to take back maybe, but I, yep. I read the part about the, um, the 504 and IEP students. Yeah. So that's a challenge right out of the gate for any of these programs. Um, yep. And there's a mention here about self-selection out by families. Yes. And others saying, look, we just don't help. And the others are like, well, we, we offer it, but it's Tough. shaky. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's a piece of the bigger question about um, just general equality of access yeah. and um, if our district overall district goal is moving towards equity and inclusion and and making sure that uh, the kids who are struggling at home aren't aren't mm -hmm. in somehow on the exactly. edges of our educational system, um, how do we do immersion and include? Yeah, and, and I can I can speak to a little bit of that just because I've had these conversations with Mike. Um, in the sense of there's, there's significant evidence that if a, if a child um, has a special need that's language based, there's a lot of evidence that says this is not the best place for them to be. Um, and Chittenden and East was very honest about that with families when they were talking about immersion when, with kids with special needs that are language based. So not all special needs are language based. Um, that's important to understand. So that's just a snippet for that that one little piece. As, as far as services and things, I don't know how they're handling it right now. I just have no idea on that. Um, and then you made me think of another one too. What was the second well, part Well, I just of that? think the, the, I don't know. I mean, I just think, I mean, I'm a huge fan, right? But what I'm concerned about is that we create sort of like a privilege thing versus yeah. uh, everyone else. I know what I was gonna say to that. Can I just answer that real, real quick? Another thing that I know to Denise has done um, is that when they have the lottery and, and people apply to the lottery, they hold slots for students who are free and reduced. So okay. the lottery is less okay. than that to try to address the equitability okay. in kids who right. may be on the fringe in other places. Right. And the self-selection out, you still have to kind of yep. encourage some in, you know, yes. or whatever, right? Yeah. So. yeah. So they had procedures in place. This particular group helps you think through all of those That's things that we, we may do. not think of as, you know, I was interested in the white paper about the have the have not part. That the culture they spoke about, we needed to work on the fact of these kids are s segregated or separated, and <coughs> they, that that that's an interesting thing to think about. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to hear you say from a 
mom of a student who doesn't you could, pass. You can't yeah. get it. So because but, she's old, not because she didn't get it. <laughs> she's too old. But it's an uh, it's an interesting thing to talk about. And the other thing that I I didn't see in the seven, but it's probably in there somewhere. Is I wish this group would also talk about evaluation in the program. Oh, the so there, it is in there. It, it is in there. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is a longer brief as to what this group does. Um, and that piece is as part of it, teaching you how to assess and evaluate the program. Um, another thing I've, I really dug into this today, um, I skimmed it before, but I really dug into it, that I think the board, I, I noted to myself that I think the board really wants to know is a piece of this um, is a considerable focus on social cultural competency and equity piece in terms of social cultural awareness and that kind of thing. That's a significant part of their push in the immersion process. So um, in a way that um, I know that the community of Montpelier values. So that's just something that was that stood out to me as I was digging into this today. So Mike will absolutely come back and talk to you guys. <laughs> he just couldn't tonight. Um, so if you have more questions or want to know in depth more about CESU's experience, he's definitely a better voice of, to say that than I am. Jim, you were going to say something? Sorry. Um. I've got a question there. I think the comment is just you know keep in mind that the study is going to really show yeah, us how it. we're just starting how to get there and how to answer I think a lot of okay. these questions. Um, and I guess I have two questions. One, how much how much will the group doing the study kind of look to the board and others for input about the type of questions we want answered? And second, which is a question you can totally punt on if you want to, what would be a language based versus a non language based learning? Um, so, well, let me address that. Like a language-based disability could be a specific learning disability yeah. in reading, for instance. It could be a speech and language piece for kids coming in with significant articulation challenges. I'm not sure if we're presenting content in a different language and asking them to learn a different language might be the best route for that mm -hmm. child. Um, it may be. It, it's just we would have to question that. We would have to have really have to take a hard look at that. So that would be, those would be two examples of a potential language disability. Uh, your first question, I would imagine that there would be a member of the board on the study committee. Okay. I would encourage a member of the board yeah, to be yeah, on be, the study be, committee, if not to. very interested, yeah. Yeah. So that would probably be your liaison to the information. Sure. Can you clarify about the committee's role, you said something about they would make the decision, not the administration or something like that? They would be the people who would be really digging into the questions and deciding what's going to happen next. So I like to have a decision making ma matrix, right? Um, we, talk, we use it at our league meetings when we need to, when hard decisions need to be made to be clear. Some decisions I would imagine that were probably not the clearest clear statement. Some, some decisions may just be a board of, of an administrative decision. Right, and, and we'd make that clear. It may come down to location. That could be a really tricky conversation to have. And so we might say, and I'm not positive on this, but we might say, um, in deciding location, we're gonna see here pros and cons of both buildings, and the committee is going to inform the administration, and the administration will make the final decision based on everything that we've heard. Um, so there could be some decision-making matrixes in there, but the committee would be responsible for really digging into some hard conversations that would have to be had. Well, isn't it likely that the committee digs into it and makes a recommendation yes. to yeah. the administration and the board, and then the, yeah. that decision goes there somewhere? To the administration. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Andrew. So in terms of this committee makeup, are we thinking that it would involve maybe at least one board member, maybe a, t a foreign language teacher or two in our district, some community members who are invested, interested in this, or might have expertise in this. Is that what we're thinking? How would this, I just pose this There's specific thing. language in here as to who okay. the steering committee is. Okay. <laughs> and, it, and yes, okay. to all of those things. And also <coughs> EL teacher, mm -hmm. um, a general education teacher, mm -hmm. principal, you know, thinking a little bit outside that as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there is recommendations in here, like they guide you through that program process as to how to best select people. Because you want some naysayers mm -hmm. in this particular process as well. You want some people who are going to be like, mm, 
the devil's advocate, if you will. Sure. Well, I have a question that actually Andrew brought up last time, and that this looks great. It looks like a good plan. How would we choose them in preference to somebody else who might do this? I'm going to go with what Mike said last time, that when CESU researched that, there were two people, two companies um, to go with. And when I was talking to Mike later about that, he said there are two companies, and the second one is a spinoff of this one. So it's really people who have gone off the reservation for these to get, you know, to earn their own money in their independent consultancies, from what he understands. We can do more research to see if there's more. I mean, there's no nothing stopping us from doing that. Um, and I would, I would say that my colleagues probably at Chittenden East probably did a considerable amount of research into that already. But we can certainly do more research. There's nothing holding us back from that. To add to that, can you just send out an RFI and notify right. these different companies? Yeah, that's probably how we do it. How yeah. we do it. Yeah. So that, that wouldn't be too mm -hmm. burdensome for you guys, would it? I think we should. It's taxpayer dollars. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks for pushing this forward. Yeah. Seriously. Thank you. Yeah, that no, was exciting. So it's a great program. Yep. So. I'm just sad I'm not young enough to participate. <laughs> <laughs> you can come visit, Steve. You can come be a, a, a reader in there and read some books. <laughs> and again, I apologize for Mike that he's not here. He truly wanted to be. Just, um, could it be tonight? And for my inadequacy of taking <laughs> his you big big shoes. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you. Up next. Do you have something else? Um, well, Jim's the Jim's the chair here. Jim's the agenda man. Yes. Um, I think that's it for the yeah. superintendent report. So you're on again. Yeah, so I can take any questions from the superintendent report. Originally, when Jim and I had planned out um, meetings or year-long meetings in advance, uh, this meeting was supposed to be a, a real dive, big, a deep dive into the entry plan and what I found. But we didn't think about that it's also budget season and that's just way too much for a board agenda. So when Jim and I were talking about the super report for this week, we, we thought we'd just kind of hit on some things, so I'm happy to ask answer any questions that you have from what's there. Again, we're going to bring the entry plan back, but this is just a quick, quick hit. I think so. your three biggies are great. Oh, I do too. The three I, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more about what it means to have a system and structure in place for improvement. I mean, I just... As someone who's not in that, doesn't live in that world of education, even just an example. I'll give you a good example. Yeah, that would yeah I'll give you a good example. So in my former district as the curriculum director, when um, I took over right as the Common Core had come, you know, the unpacking had been done, and I, I, was, I came into the spot where we needed to write a curriculum off of the new standards document. Um, and so... Uh, we had to think about how do you do that? What's the best way? What's the most efficient way? How do you get the smartest minds in the room? How do you train people who are going to stay and be able to continue this work? All of those things come up in my head, right? Um, I had in each of my elementary schools coaches in reading and writing. So I made the executive decision that those people would be the ones writing curriculum because they're the ones who run PLCs back in the district. They're the ones who really control professional learning. They're the ones who do data analysis up the wazoo. Um, they were the best people for the job. I had a structure in place where I met with them monthly. And they were able to be pulled from classroom or from their schools like the day before a holiday or the day before a vacation because they don't see a lot of kids on that day, right? So because I had those people and we set up that structure, that they would be doing the work and they would be the ones who go, who have the means to go back to their buildings and teach the teachers the curriculum and work through challenges and bring back revisions for me as a curriculum director so we could work through it together. That process, while hard, was seamless. Um, teachers responded to it, they responded, they were the most knowledgeable people about the curriculum and our teachers were able to work off of it, you know, begin to plan units off of it, make common assessments. That same work, um, didn't happen at the same time in Montpelier and Roxbury. 
And so when Mike, as the director of curriculum, is taking over, we have no structure in place to get that work done. So, and it needs to get, it should have been done four or five years ago. So right now we're having to decide who do you, who do you include? Who do you have do it? Um, do you use staff meeting time to do it? This is gonna take forever. That's, that's like 45 minutes every once in a while that principals don't need it. Um, do you pull teachers from classrooms to do it so that it influences the kids and is a sub cost? Do you pay teachers after school to do it? In which case, how do you decide which teachers to do it with? Um, so we have so many questions. We, we don't know how, like that work isn't able to be done quickly and efficiently yet because there's no structure or system to do that kind of work um, in place. And there's a few other instances that that kind of forward thinking hasn't happened. Um, and I'll give you another example too. I was talking in labor relations the other night and they were asking about the SEL coordinator and they said, well, we have APs, just train them. And I said, okay, so Steve's my AP, he leaves. He, APs want to be principals, right? <laughs> They're not APs for long, except for Jen at the high school. She wants to be an AP forever. Um, and she's very good at it. So when Matt Roy leaves at the middle school, which he will, and he should, because he's going to be a principal sometime, we got to retrain whoever comes in. There's no system in place. It's dependent on a person, right? And so if, with a social emotional coordinator, that person can come in, take an audit of what our strengths are, what our weaknesses are, where the capacity needs to be built at the teaching level, at the administrative level, and start putting in systems in place. So when a person new comes in, the staff can say, welcome, this is how we do it. This is what works for us. Here's our evidence for it. And we currently don't have that. It's very person dependent. And, and I'll add to that. One of the things when I worked at the State Department that would happen, I'd go to school and they'd say, we've all been trained in X. And I'd say, oh really? And when did you do that training? And they'd say, well, three years ago, everybody in the building was trained. And I'd say, really? So tell me how many people are here that were here three years ago? Oh, the answer would be, you know, three. <laughs> Compared, and that, your, this kind of a system takes care of that. You're training from within, so everybody gets trained right along. You're, you're, and everybody has the same background. Yeah, and you can develop expertise in a different way. That's what I'm kind of thinking about there. That's really helpful. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <coughs> Any other questions about the things I highlighted that I'm really thinking about? I'm loving the data collection. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> they know because they heard me forever. So I'm so glad that we're going to work on it. Yeah. I like to geek out on data. It's really hard to do that right now. <laughs> I also just think I'm really impressed that we're able to talk about our weaknesses in writing. And I think that we all need to be able to do that. And then, it's, you know, it doesn't mean anyone's rendering a verdict on anything. It just means we're, we're continuing to work. And I think that the more we can call out our own areas that we need help in and we need to work on, I think it's going to be more transparent for the community. We're all going to be on the same soapbox in terms of the way we talk to people. It's like, yeah, these are things we haven't we haven't done as well as we want to and we're gonna work on these. Like, rather than no, we're good. Yeah. Which is what the what happens when you don't point out areas you need to grow in. So thank you for doing that too. I have, you're two, never I have two statements that I yeah. that I use a lot is when you know more you do better. And mm -hmm. the second one that I have in my office actually up on the dry erase that people try to erase but I don't let them is that uh, data is information, not condemnation. Yeah. So we just mm -hmm. need to really think about how do we use it as information so that we can get better at what we do. But I mean, just seeing the lack of data collection. Like, I'm like, yeah, that's cool. We can fix that. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. a fixable yeah. problem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not like and the lack of, of intelligence. <laughs> <Right>. you <know>? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and actually collecting the data will tell you what you're doing really great at yeah. and not okay. doing so exactly. great at, and then you'll know how to fix it. Great. Well, also on data, and I've had conversations with Andrew and Libby about this, and you know, we've had some requests. You know, in the budget process, Andrew asked for you know kind of long-term budget data. Michelle's asked for some data. I think about you know what's going on in the classrooms. I think you or Ryan asked for data about class size numbers. Um, <coughs> what we thought we'd do is because some of those are kind of like you know, come during busy times or, and a lot of that data is not there or not collected necessarily in the way that we want. So what I thought would be a useful conversation to have after the budget process is over is kind of what sort of 
the data would be useful for the board on kind of an ongoing basis. Um, then have just an odd discussion with the administration about, you know, is, is that data that's available? Uh, and maybe, a, you know, a deep dive on some things where we might feel data might be useful and the administration says, well, either that data is not going to tell you much or it's, you know, going to tell you something different than you think it's going to. And then kind of make a decision as a board about the type of data we'd like and then give the administration, you know, time to put that together and put it in the form we wanted to. So we, you know, are kind of getting that data on a regular basis. Um, we're not having, you know, questions on Monday, like could you on Wednesday's meeting tell me about all the teachers and, you know, what schools they went to and how many kids are in their classes and you know, how many people are named John. And, um, so, so, yeah, there's some expectations about what's out there and, you know, I think reasonable time for the, um, for the administration to get together. You know, so like the budget, you know, each year we have, you know, a certain set of trends that make sense and you know a year in advance about what, you know, what sort of budget data trends the board's expecting. Does that make sense to folks? It does, and as a matter of fact, since I think the bottom line is we would like to know how the students are doing, yes. it would be interesting when we begin that conversation for Libby to tell us what it is she thinks yep, we exactly. are up to tell us how the students are doing. Yep. It, in addition to that, that's my ex that's where I can thrive in. I know. But I'm not like I don't thrive in budget. You know, like predicting what kind of questions you may have around budget. So. So I think it is definitely helpful to think it's a, with a board hat too, because I've never yeah. been a board member. I don't have that hat. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I the, the student data I can def I'll definitely be sharing that for you once we collect it in a way that works. Yeah, and I, th <laughs> I think that's why having this discussion is good because yeah, there there are questions the community asks of us. Um, yeah, that might require a certain set of data that. It, yeah that you might not find it super useful or, helpful right. or necessary, but, yeah. Actually, what I was thinking, though, was she might have a set of data that would answer whatever that big yeah, question exactly. is without the data that they're specifically asking. Yeah. It's just something we haven't had yeah. before. And this is an exciting time to start thinking about collecting data because it's our first year as, yeah. a, as a new exactly. district. Exactly. So if we start collecting data right now, we have the whole history. Because <laughs> this is the history. That's true. Uh, three or four times I've heard exciting and collecting data. <laughs> 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 you need to hang out. Yeah. I'm changing the leadership. Don't work in my yes, office. Well, you surely do. <laughs> uh, excellent. So, uh, any more questions for Libby? So, uh, next up is a budget presentation. Um, the main purpose of doing the full budget presentation twice is to. Uh, give Roxbury residents a chance to ask questions. Um, I'm guessing Ben has some familiarity with the budget already. And as a Waterbury resident, he may not. Yes, yeah, so as a Waterbury. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess a question for the board, do you want Grant to go through the full shebang again? Um, because that's already on tape for you know, folks who want to do it on tape. And this is, this is not a live recording, right? Actually, well, that's <laughs> Good question. I'm not sure if it's working live right now, in all honesty. Okay. <laughs> but they're working on it. Working live. It's supposed to be live. <laughs> okay. Um, but we have on, on tape. So, so my question. Who do you have? We're recording yeah. this one. We recorded yeah. the last one. Right? We do have the last one. Uh, so my question is, do we want to go through the whole shebang again, or do we want Grant to just kind of um, maybe do the overview slides and then tell us about things that are different or things changes. Yeah, things yeah. Change. Differences. Okay. I think both changes from last time to this time and also changes from kind of the last year to this year kind of big points of change. It's now, not that you're not scintillating yeah. and yeah. wonderful in your presentation, Lord but... <laughs> <laughs> um, that works fine for me. Um, yeah. You may have to be patient because I've got about 50 notes on every slide because I was expecting to go through the whole thing, so I may be hunting and pecking for okay. notes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll um, it's easiest for you, but you Anybody can need hard copies? Are they different? Yes. Yes. They are different from the last time. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. They're not yes, different they're from what I sent or what Heather sent out. Yeah. 
So yeah. you're good? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I can use a hard copy to follow along. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah it's different I than last time. time. Yeah, we did send it out on Monday because we were waiting to see if the state was going to give us some new numbers. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and I am so. glad to give out as many as you'll take because that means I don't have to carry <laughs> so them all. Oh, do you have them? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to grab a drink of water, but I'll take one. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Really? He's smarter than the rest of us. <laughs> All right, so I will try to just make sure I hit some of the highlights and changes. Um, on the outline, so speaking of changes, there's now a section for changes from the December 5th presentation. Um, I would ask, as we go through this, if you can also think about the public forum on January 2nd. And if you have any ideas on how you might want to make adjustments to this presentation for the January 2nd um, public forum, um, if you could think about that so that we can take some notes down and uh, make some adjustments. Uh, nothing has changed on this context slide. I will change. I have foreign language on your hard copies. I've changed it to world language to be more appropriate. Um, I'm sure we'll get into the busing uh, discussion. Um, mm -hmm. And the use of fund balance is something that will pop up later as well. So the changes in future slides, you're going to see some cells that are highlighted in blue. Those I tried to highlight in blue things that had changed. Um, things that are in yellow are still things that are unknown. Um, the dollar yield and non-residential rate we have, uh, it's still kind of an unknown to some extent because it has to be set by law. but those numbers are probably as good as it's going to get until after town meeting day. Um, some of the other changes I had a, on one employee, I had an error, so I had to fix that. That cost $8,000. Um, we took another snapshot of all health coverages. Um, and of course, they all went in the wrong direction financially. You know, people going from two person to family. Um, I think I had it's one not the wrong financially. <laughs> I mean, it's a great thing. We should all celebrate. <laughs> yeah. but not in this moment. <laughs> um, tech center tuition went up about six thousand dollars. So when we were talking about Central Vermont Tech Center, um, they gave me a new te a tuition rate which when I factored that in, raised our expenses considerably. Um, that may come back down again because we don't have our six semester average, which that's how you end up figuring out how much you have to spend. It's based on the average number of kids over a three year period times the tuition rate. They did say while I was there that we have more kids than we had one. We do. Yeah, we have, and our six semester average is right at 10 right now. And the, the good thing is, because it's over six semesters, if you have a big jump in one year, you don't have to pay for it all in that one year. It gets split out. So right now, I've assumed we're going to have 11 as a six semester average, which hopefully that's safe. Um, for revenues, uh, we got a new, a new number for the small schools grant. Um, the AOE has told me that the small schools grant will be the amount everybody received two years ago. And so I got that number, and it's about $3,000 less than what I had before. I also heard that by statute, that goes on, uh, and the phrase is in perpetuity. So we're always going to get that small schools grant. That's another benefit of voluntarily merging, because those who didn't voluntarily merge will not continue to get the small schools grant. What was the, what's the total note on the small schools, do you remember? Um, it's, what is it, 70? I would got That's it. fine. It's in that range, though. But seventy some thousand. Yeah, I'm actually going to give you the exact number because it's not hard to find. It is seventy three thousand seven twenty two. And it'll so be pegged at that two thousand and sixteen number forever or whatever. Correct. Okay. It won't be inflated, but it won't be cut back either. So okay. to about seventy four thousand um, dollars. 
Special education in total, the number is about $36,000 less. So, Ruby, when you condemn me for always being conservative, there you go. <laughs> I was optimistic and see what it got me. Um, transportation aid, we won't get a better number, I don't think, until town meeting day, so I should probably stop saying that it's an unknown. I did bump it up by a couple thousand dollars because we're getting about 90000 this year. And I figure we'll probably at least get a couple thousand more, so I increased that by 200. Um, you approved the announced tuition rates, which are $100 more for elementary, $200 more for secondary, so that means 600 bucks in revenues. Um, something to think about if I forget to bring it up later is for tuition revenue, I've assumed that the kids that we have paying tuition are going to stay, but that we're not getting any more. That might be an assumption that we should change. I sh maybe I should assume that we're going to have one more or two more kids because we usually get some transition. We're going to have some 12th graders leave. We typically have some come in. I didn't bank on any, um, but that could be something we could tweak. So you didn't bank on replacing the graduates <coughs> with new? Right. If we had two 11th graders, yeah. I figured we'd have two 12th graders, but if we had one 12th grader, I assumed they would graduate and didn't assume we wouldn't get another ninth grader coming. Which we okay. might. And on the expense side, how did you do the tuition out money? Tuition out? Um, so really, I assume you're talking about Roxbury yeah. 9 through 12. For that, I assume that all the kids I'm paying tuition for right now, I'm going to have to pay tuition for next year, right. except not 12th graders, because right. they mm -hmm. should graduate. So and anybody that moves worst in case goes, scenario, to the, basically. goes to the Montpelier system. And, yeah. 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 And, th and that's a great place to be because I've been a business manager at a school at school choice, and that was the one thing that always would bite me because you people would know. move in yeah. that you didn't know about. Never well, now if they move in, they don't get school choice. They're going to come to our schools. Yeah. So I don't have to worry about that unknown. That's no, very clear. Yeah. Although, is it possible it is that if they came here for a year, they could still choose the tuition under, under grandfather? No. 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 Once they're in, they're in? Are you sure? <laughs> What do you yeah. mean? Not once that they, they would. Yeah, yeah, let's say somebody came early. We had one or two or three that just that could have tuitioned and did not. Yep, yeah, and I I would say oh. that I mean it might back. be a legal question, yeah. but if you had somebody that voluntarily came to Montpelier High School this year and didn't have that to. could have had school choice and they wanted to go to yeah. Northfield next year, I think my position would be no. Because it's too it's uh, to continue at the school that you've chosen. That's the policy reason, right, but I'm not sure it's the the law. Anyway, regardless, it's unlikely. Don't worry about that. Why would they want to? It's not going to happen because everybody yeah. loves That's it. Once you're here, yeah. you know, you've, My feet you've struck it rich. Tell your friends. All right. Uh, let's see. You've seen how pessimistic you were being. That's all. <laughs> no, they're all going to go back now. No, not that bad. Um, so, tax factors, the unknowns. Equalized pupil count is still a big one, and I, I have been, I think, conservative on what I've been using, and I hope it goes up. I am just very concerned about equalized pupil count because the AOE has a new system where they collected census data, and I'm just not sure how it's going to look when it comes out. And so we'll it's see. Not out. It's not out. They are starting to release some numbers, like drafty draft numbers. I would hope in time for the public forum that we might have a number. I do think that it's going to continue to change during January because of just the nature of the data that they're seeing. Um, dollar yield, non-residential rate, we've got that as good as it's going to get. CLA, last year we had it on the 15th, the year before we had it on the 23rd. I haven't seen it, but I just, it's got to be any day now, wouldn't you think? Yeah, I mean, and unfortunately I heard I initially heard it was going to be closer to 91%. Now I hear it's going to likely be a little less than 90%. So, oh. so I was I've been using 90%. Yeah. Um, Maybe make it 89. <laughs> that uh, just to give you kind of a, a reference point for equalized pupils. If you want to jot this down, if we have an increase of about seven pupils, it's about one cent on the tax rate. For CLA. A change of about 1% on CLA is probably two cents on the tax sure. rate. Yeah, about. So 14 pupils equals <coughs> one cent, one percent on the CLA. Is that what you're yeah. saying? Yeah. 
scale is important. Yes. 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 Very important. Um, so we'll see how those things go. Uh, the the other one I know is going to come out fairly soon is this the Career Center six semester average. That impacts your revenues and your expenditures. Um, expenditures more so. Uh, the revenue is the state pays part of the tech tuition on behalf of us, and so we get a revenue for a little less than half of the total tuition amount. On the expenditure side, you show the full tuition. So there's is that a about little 16, bit. about sixteen thousand per student. What is that? Um, Randolph is probably closer to seventeen. Okay. Um, Central Vermont was closer to sixteen, but now okay. um, it's probably closer to sixteen and a half. I think um, they've really jumped up. Um, so anyway, we'll move on. Yeah, now, now I understand. Uh, so, like I said, blue, and I didn't get everything that was, you know, in blue, like, technically the total budget changed because the general budget changed. Um, Non-tax revenues changed because of special education. Equalized pupils is yellow because it's still an estimate. You can see I dropped it about six kids. Um, mm -hmm. And we have more kids, so I would hope that the number goes up, not down. But, um, but being well, conservative. I'm being conservative because <laughs> I learned my lesson. Um, I didn't change anything really on here. I may have changed a few call-out boxes. The thing for everybody to remember here is the, the caption is right. This is just Montpelier High School, Main Street Middle School, and Union Elementary. K-4 Roxbury kids are not included on here because it would mess up our class size analysis. Um, but um, 5th through 12th grade students do get factored in as they transition into the middle school and high school. And we talked about this, if it's, hall, if it's colored yellow, it means we're getting real close to max class size. If it's red, it means we're over. So according to this, we'd be looking at adding classroom teacher, a classroom teacher probably in FY22. Um, we're going to be very close next year, um, but... <coughs> But yeah, 22 looks like the year. We'll see how the enrollment projections continue to trend. And this, since we didn't have Roxbury, this just completes the picture for K-4. Um, staffing. The only thing I changed here is I took out some of the words on the human resources coordinator because we decided to go ahead and show a separate slide. And it's a little wordy. <laughs> And I'm not going to go through everything, but I will tell you that it's not a complete list. This is just like a few things that popped out as we were talking about this position. Um, I will admit I am a huge advocate for this. Um, I will say that we're getting the job done, but it's among five different people. Um, and I'm one of those five. And I will tell you that if we had made a different choice for HRA um, vendors, we'd be done we would be done. There's mm -hmm. just no other way around it. Um, and I think I've mentioned that there's a statewide uniform chart of accounts coming out that we're having to have in place by July 1, a new HR finance system that we're going to be supposedly ready to go on July 1. Those are going to create a lot of transition work for two of the people, two of the five people that do some HR work. Um, and whenever we do this, there's going to be an opportunity, hopefully, to do some automation for timesheets, leave tracking. I need somebody to kind of run point on trying to get those things up and running. We just don't have the capacity. For those of you who have been around for a while, you know the business office used to have two and a half people, and that half person just didn't work. You know, it, it's very hard to make that a very effective or efficient um, job. So we just went with two people other than me. Um, I do think there is a strong need there, strong need there, and I'm sure Becky would admit totally it would. Totally agree. Mm -hmm. um, HR and finance are two areas where it's not getting any less complicated. I mean, it just gets more and mm -hmm. more convoluted. Um, for us, another thing is with the merger this year, we got to do two of everything. Um, tax documents that we send out, you know, you get your W. W-2s and you get your 1099s and all these things. We have to do two sets for everybody because they were MPS and now they're MRSD. Um, so it's 
it's an area where there's a lot of liability if something falls through the cracks. And I would say we haven't let anything fall through the cracks, but I would say there's a risk that we certainly could. Dina. Yeah. And I'm looking at job descriptions for all positions, and I can't imagine you had any time to get to many of those, and we've got a lot of them to do, right? We've we got one for we me. We have one for me. Mm -hmm. like, Alrighty, no we've <laughs> done. <laughs> well, let me ask you something, Tina. Were, yes. Did you have job descriptions at all the schools where you worked? Um, do all the teachers need job descriptions? It's not a case of all the teachers need job descriptions, but. I don't know that we have a job description for any position. I mean, do we have a job description for him? Probably not. Do we have a job description for a coordinator of special ed or the, you know, we just had, didn't have any job descriptions. So for the big categories. What, what I'm wondering though is how the job description thing, I've asked some teachers at other schools, like, do you have job descriptions? And I haven't heard from any of them that they have job descriptions. So I'm that, curious I would say that. Without a job description, it's hard to evaluate. That's it. I, I agree with you completely. We also I, employ I, more people than just teachers. So yeah, that, no, I, that I understand that. Piece. So I would, I would assume that there's a general, when I was a principal, there was a general job description for teaching, mm -hmm. and that's what I use to evaluate teaching. It's not like the second grade teacher has a different job description than the third grade teacher. Same thing for custodians. There, you know, there's a job description for custodians. A job description could be out there for IAs right. or teachers. There, it might be broken down by different types of teaching, okay. um, but it's really all the other positions that you should have. And like, Certainly the administrative. Yeah. Start, yeah. yeah. And, if, and I've gone to, uh, to like my old district, Essex Westford. They have them all posted. I mean, there are dozens and dozens of job descriptions for school personnel that are out there and, and we literally have one right now which makes it kind of difficult for supervision and evaluation. I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm not a proponent of having job descriptions because I certainly am. I was just curious to know. Um, Do other people have? Yeah. Well I have to tell you that um, the world doesn't do supervision and evaluation well. <laughs> <laughs> and so <laughs> you don't notice you don't have them in some cases until somebody tries to evaluate somebody and there's nothing to evaluate them against. Mm -hmm. Which is so what which has happened this year. We've been mm -hmm. an administrator was told you can't evaluate me, I don't have a job description. Which I'm surprised hasn't happened more often. Yeah. You know, because without a job description you really can't the employee can say all along, Well, I didn't have this I did not know I had this expectation. The and evaluation this, is irrelevant. And and to kind of get to what you were at, because of the fact that it may not be critical every each and every day, that's why this is one thing that didn't get done mm -hmm. and, and hasn't been done. Um, but it would be good to have it done. Um, and if we had a position like this, I'm sure we would start chipping away at that. So this HR coordinator position is scheduled for a higher on July 1? If the budget gets approved, yes. Would we consider? hiring two months early and taking it out of some one-time money. I'm just, you know, there's a lot to, maybe, maybe that's not a hard, maybe July 1, not a lot of new things are beginning. <laughs> but it sounded like there were. Well, I know, you just said there were. <laughs> <laughs> you just said there were. Right? So what I'm wondering yeah. is if you get somebody for not a lot of money out of a budget to start two months early, you've got a wonderful time to get them ramped up, get some things in place, maybe help get some of that stuff in place for July 1. I don't know, but you I'm saying it's not. You do mean after the budget has been passed so you know the community is sure, approved. Sure, but that's a long issue. distance still. You've still got time to do the hire. And if you try to push that for um, a May 1 hire, you will get a big uh, load off your shoulders for not a lot of money because of the timing, just because of the timing, nothing else. It would definitely, I would say once, the, if the budget, when the budget gets passed, um, I would say it would be great to be able to put it out and see if we get some great candidates, early. then I would, I would definitely come back to the board and ask if, if it would be okay to hire a month or two early. early. Um, it really depends on the strength of candidates. And I get if we it. Have yeah, good you candidates wait until you get that, the right one. Yeah. There might yeah. be good candidates that can't do it until then anyway. Yeah. Right, so that's true. That's but I was saying this position may not fall on a typical academic calendar higher, maybe it does. It depends on the okay. candidates, yeah. yeah. Okay. But, but yeah. That's a great idea, Steve. 
it's just it, you know I see it every day where you know you get somebody who comes in and it's it's not intuitive to know where to go. I mean, if they come in because they need to do fingerprinting and background checks, oh heaven, or if they come in. Or <laughs> if they come in to sign up Can't for help that that that's, that's Joanne's. Plans. You know, it, if they are interested in a contract for IA, that's. Spooky. And then there's yeah. just daily crises, just mm -hmm. daily. Yeah. Right. Not, and I don't mean like you know evaluation crises. I mean more like just where does this fall in our policy kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and health, health is the big one things. where we get daily mm -hmm. things yeah. where you know, hey, I got this bill. I don't know if I should pay it or not, and you have to kind of go through with them, get on a website, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so not, not to belabor that point, but I can tell you a very definitive story from one, one of the first couple months. I walked into the business office and there was an employee in tears sitting next to Joe who's trying to talk her through in a public space through healthcare that her husband would, you know, like, that's not Joe's job. Joe is a fabulous person and wonderful person with payroll. That's not her job in a public space to, to work with an employee who's obviously upset about and trying to figure out the healthcare system. It's just, it's not good for employees. And there's privacy issues too. Yeah, all yeah. of the healthcare really yeah. not H HR in general should always have a closed door. Yeah. So. And we're semi-private because the business office is just the three mm -hmm. of us, but but there's a lot of traffic that comes mm -hmm. through there. So mm -hmm. well, it's just not an HR department. It's, it's the business office. Yeah. yeah. And I, I can tell you like in my old um, Essex Westford, yeah, the budget was three times higher, but they had an actual HR department with the director assistant director and administrator administrative yeah. assistant I mean there were three or four people in there and we've got none so I've already hopefully I've we'll yeah, done yeah. this yeah. I would probably yeah. take this is an example of something I probably would take out for the public forum and then just put another bullet or two back on that previous slide because mm -hmm. I don't think we need to go into this level of detail this right. was more for you yeah no I you know what's interesting about this slide though you might have it not there but I hate to say it, printed, so that somebody who says, really, an HR person, what would they do? You're going you're gonna to get that. I think, yeah, I get I think that. so. Yeah, yeah me and too. I, I will probably put a lot of slides in backup so that we can get to them. I've gotten that from people who are super supportive of our schools. They're like, really, an HR coordinator yeah. for the administration? They better justify that. And I feel like you guys have. I mean, I spoke with Libby for half an hour the other day, and Jim for quite a bit of, about this, and I feel like it is very justified. But... It's well, something that I think. Yeah, you're right. Because it's not. It's not. What it, What is this going to do for my kid? Exactly. You know, yeah. But it it, it is exactly. eventually. I mean, if we if we can't take care of our employees, they're not going to be taking care of our kids. Yeah, I only have ten um, employees, and I want an HR work. I can't comprehend how you can do this. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it, it might be that it's not this slide, but a slide that ties this to how it actually does allow the district to better serve. Employees and their board students. You know, a couple of bullets yeah. we could maybe put our heads together. But I mean, that's really yeah. what we're trying to get at. That right. we need to serve our employees better mm -hmm. by giving them access to this. We need to have time available, other people to do other things. This this is ultimately about the district accomplishing its objective of educating students. It's just and I, I think the good steps. the good example to kind of throw out there is we all know that that there's going to be statewide health negotiations next mm -hmm. year. When that comes down. We could be looking at redoing everything we just did for HRAs. Yeah. And if we have to do that, we need to make sure somebody is taking care of the employees because if you have teachers in you know, our office that are upset and crying over the bills that they're getting hit with, they're certainly not going to have their head in the game to try to do the best for teaching our kids. Yeah. So that is kind of one of the real examples of something that could happen starting next year. And, and, and I also... I think we might not want to get too cute about this, too, and just kind of say to people, you know, bring that up, say, this is a 200-plus person employee organization. Then can you think of another 200-plus employee organization that shouldn't have an HR director? And I think, you know, does your business have an HR director? And I think most people will be like, well, I've got 50 employees with an HR director. Of course we need an HR director. Who do I go to when I have questions about my health benefits? Mm -hmm. So I, mean, I think, you know, just having some frank conversations that, you know, in addition to educating people, this is a place that employs people and it has extensive employees and a pretty extensive budget. And what? I can't imagine how business managers survive in districts who didn't choose our health care. <laughs> yes. Mm. I hear about them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like, for, for labor contracts. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like, yeah. Yeah, one anecdotal experience I was even thinking about 
after talking with Libby the other night was the idea of you know harassment diversity training. That's something that state employees receive, and it's extremely helpful. And hearing from some of our stu from our two student representatives, it sounds like that type of training might also be helpful in our schools as well to raise real ties. There it is. Yeah. yeah. This is H this general right. HR type function. Yeah. Okay. Let's okay. Keep moving. Yeah. All right. Um, and I think a lot of this is going to go pretty quick because I'm just going to highlight the changes. I think that for the um, informational session, I'm just and if you remember last year, we did this too. We only started looking at expenses one way instead of two ways. So I think we'll probably cut the ones by category and just go by program, yes. which yeah, means this, so. special ed, mm -hmm. um, general ed, co-curricular. So we'll take a snapshot looking at things this way. Um, and on this slide, once again, I tried to kind of hit in blue things that have changed, which most of that has to do with um, the salaries and health benefits that I talked about where I had to tweak some things, those hit under the categories of general ed, special ed, and buildings and grounds. Those were the people that I was talking about having to make adjustments for salaries and health. Um, the other one that's highlighted is career center tuition. I mentioned that I had a higher tuition rate that I had to plug in. So those are kind of the big numbers that had changed on the expense side. Um, I think in total is about $49,000 uh, at the exact total, and most of that was health benefits and new snapshot. So I will skip by category, which is you know salaries, benefits, tuition. Uh, in revenues, you know, we have a very colorful chart. Uh, the line items in blue have changed. Education spending is going to change anytime any other number changes because it balances your expenses and revenues. Um, Small schools grant I mentioned is about three thousand dollars lower. Uh, special ed intensive is about sixty thousand dollars lower than I was using, um, and they're basing that on fifty-six percent reimbursement of eligible costs. And I was using a higher percentage, so that kind of bit me. The block grant is about twenty-four thousand dollars higher than I had before. Um, the extraordinary and and triple uh, E, which is essential early education. Those were off only by about $1,000. They were very close. Um, tuition, that $600 waterfall of money based on the announced tuition, that would be the area where if I assume that we're going to have more than two elementary and two secondary students coming back and maybe at least one new high school student, that would be another sixteen grand in there. Um, so that would be something to think about. Should we be more realistic there and assume we're going to get one more tuition? Um, in yellow, tech on behalf will change based on the six semester average, and that's really about half of the tuition bill that you get. Um, transportation aid, I think I'm going to stop highlighting it because I don't think we're going to get a better number. Balance forward is the fund balance revenue that we're going to use. And remember, the whole idea behind this was we thought we were going to drop our one time expenses in projects from FY19 to FY20 by like 250,000, and we only dropped it by about 168,000. So to meet the goal that we set, we said, well, we'll use $87,000 worth of fund balance, which basically is like dropping your expenses by another 87. So that allowed us to hit the target. It's something I highlighted because it's your decision, uh, and it's something we should think about because in FY21, if we look a year ahead at tax rates, if we drop our uh, project costs down by 87000 and then take away this fund balance, it's not going to help the tax rate at all in FY21 because you're dropping both. Mm -hmm. um, if we drop it now, it's a near-term hit. It would be a challenge for our tax rate this year. But next year when we drop our expenses and the revenues not, we're going to have to mess with revenues, we're really dropping expenses. I mean, we're dropping our ed spending and would help us drop the tax rate and absorb some of that two cent tax merger, or merger incentive that we have to kind of soak up. So it's something we're thinking about and it may not be something we decide right away. It may be we wait until we get CLA, we wait until we get equalized pupils and if those things are favorable and drop our tax rate some more, maybe we say, you know what, that's a good number to hit for tax rate purposes, let's adjust this so that we don't have to worry about that. I mean, I would take it out now and then 
and then put it back put in if we have to. Prices. That's the other thing because if we go to the public forum with the tax rate of whatever, six cent increase, and then we take this out and it's a seven cent increase, that's a harder thing yeah. for the public to have to absorb. That's what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. But um, if you all are okay with it, especially um, if we get a CLA number that's okay, and if we get equalized pupils that is favorable, I can start dropping that down some. Yeah. And then I can maybe be a little on the optimistic side of dropping it down, and because we can always, like you said, yeah. put it back in. Yeah. So I will drop it down. It'll be somewhat lower than this, anywhere from zero to this. But with your permission, I, I will reduce it somewhat. Yeah. I'll have to decide. Unless we kick that problem can down the road, the better. So yeah, I have I have one question on this, and I'm in, a, I'm in agreement with Steve on this. In terms of our anticipated unreserved fund balance, the last time the finance committee met, we, we were looking, we were anticipating it was going to be around nine hundred thousand dollars on the year. Do you have any sense, has that changed heading into next year? Do you think that might bump back up a little bit? It actually bumped up considerably at the end of this last year um, okay. because we ended up with a good size surplus. Mm -hmm. And the number now I can say, based on our final audit, which I just got, is um, it's $30,000 less. So it's 870 is what our fund balance is. Okay. Um, and I can tell you now, I'll tell you later too, but. Um, what happened was we got a land water conservation grant that 150,000 for the playground. We actually got $30,000 of that. And I basically kind of double counted that. Okay. And so that needed to be taken out okay. of the fund balance. So instead of 900, it's about 870, okay. um, which is a good fund balance. Yeah, um, and I think right now we're looking pretty good for 19 yeah. to finish on target or maybe a little bit of a surplus. Um, I think it's great right now to have that money available because yeah. as we're getting ready to put out RFPs for that bond, I mean, the prices just are scaring me with what we're hearing are happening out there with construction uh, RFPs. So it's nice to know that we have a little bit of flexibility there to be able to put back something if we have to. Mm -hmm. You never know what's going to happen in construction. Yeah. And in, in, a, in a few cases, we may try to move some money around during FY19. Like, I know we're going to come in under budget for tuition for 9 through 12th because I have my first semester bills in. There's a lot less kids than we anticipated because they moved or they're going to tech center. Um, so I know I'm going to have a good amount of money there. Um, uh, if you look, you know, uh, the van is out there right now that I drove the kids down after school today. We went ahead and bought that van because I had some money left in merger, and I knew I was going to have some excess. So I had talked at the beginning of the budget process about a one-time expense for a van. We already did. So you know, those are those are some things that if if we see that we can afford it, we'll do it. I'll bring it up as part of the quarterly reports to say, hey, this is what we're looking at doing. Um, but it helps. Everything that we do will help us. To to be able to deliver a bond project that is at least as close as possible to what we advertise. All right, let me uh, move on. The capital plan, um, one of the things I was looking forward to being able to s explain um, if we had Roxbury people here was, yes, we understand Roxbury's not on this list, but there's a reason why. Um, the reason why is because the roof is in great shape here, the heat plant's in great shape here, there isn't any kind of major capital project that we see in the near term for Roxbury. That's why it's not on here. I will also say that um, if you've been to the kitchen, you'll notice that we did a lot of work in the kitchen this year. We're gonna do some work on doors, um, the card readers still this year. There's still money that we're spending this year in this school. And next year we put 62,500 in project costs for Roxbury in the general budget, not in the capital. Um, so, like the bathroom around the corner, there's two bathrooms there, they both could use some work. So either we might do a big project in one bathroom or do a little bit in both bathrooms to make those better. We're going to do some work in the town hall. So it's not that we're ignoring Roxbury, it's just there's not a big capital thing that we see. Um, although something could pop up and we can certainly adjust anything beyond FY20. FY20 we said last year we were going to do bathrooms at Main Street, that's what we're going to do. Um, FY21 and on, we always have the time to make adjustments there. I don't think there's big expectations that we have to do any of these things.
for sure um, that this is a good snapshot of at least what we're seeing out there. I mean, the one big thing that's on this list is window replacements that we do have to tackle at some point, um, and there's a lot of them. I don't think Roxbury folks should would be too surprised. I mean, that was, uh, Ryan can attest this, that was one of the strong things that Roxbury came to Montpelier with was like, you're gonna, the buildings that will be part of the new district, the building is in, has no deferred maintenance. Yeah. Yeah. And whereas, and we were like, well, you should know right now before we get married that we got a ton of deferred maintenance. <laughs> yeah, and that we're gonna be, we're gonna have a big bond. And they're like, oh, okay, well, you know. So, I mean, it was very interesting. That dynamic was like, one district comes in with everything ready to go, the other one with a mess, frankly, on the buildings. And it was, that was the deal from the beginning. Yeah, and I, I will say the one thing that wasn't the kitchen was a bit of a mess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and they were they had started to plan right for up that. Front about yeah. that. And they they did yeah. put an initial investment yeah. into that right as we were transitioning. Right. Mm -hmm. they um, were, but we they put, knew that we put a significant amount of money on top of that to get it. Uh, and what's I think ready. what's cool too is if something like you say if something does come up, all of a sudden oh, you know some the septic fails or whatever. It's like they're part of a larger base now, so that that can be absorbed and solved without a budget crisis. Yeah. Which is Absolutely. a real, which is a good thing about, about that. We could get wet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At the dowry. And another good thing is, uh, for Rock, from Roxbury's perspective, yeah. is the tax rate calculation. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I love this slide because it gives you the mathematical yeah, operations, so you can actually do the calculations and know how it works. I mean, it is a little over. Bearing, Only a business manager. I know. <laughs> 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 no, it's great. <laughs> I love this slide. I appreciate it too. <laughs> I got it here, Thank you. Um, the, the reason why I say Roxbury is going to is happy yeah. about this or should be very happy about this is their tax rate went down this year. It's going to go down next year. I guarantee it's going to go down the next, next year, year um, just because of the, the merger. Yeah. And, and it would actually go down a lot more, but it can't go down by more than 5% mm -hmm. by statute. Um, so I will say that, if, or I would say, if, if somebody from Roxbury was here looking at this, I would tell them, the one thing you should take away from this is, if I add a million dollars to the budget, it's not going to change your tax rate. If I cut a million dollars, it's not going to change your tax rate. I mean, that 1.654 equalized rate is as low as it can go, and I would literally have to put millions of dollars in the budget to make it go up. Um, That's so just if you live in Roxbury. Yeah. Just for the Roxbury tax rate, <laughs> right? Did Roxbury just redo its grand list? Is that why you're at 100%? It must Obviously have been the other. past few years. It's been at least three years ago. It's been a little while now. Think, it, been. it may change this next time. We're, we're trying now. to figure out how long it's been. The realtors been. are I'm saying that Roxbury work. real estate's hot right now. I don't know if it's true or not, but I'm hearing that. Which I hear lots of families with kids are moving in. <laughs> And that's a good and bad thing. I mean, it's, it's great for the community and everything, but it will be bad for the tax rate because <laughs> that means your CLA is going to drop like a rock. And right, and too bad every be. additional student doesn't make up for that, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You've got to get 14 of them. <laughs> so the big things on this slide are what's highlighted in yellow. I'm just chomping at the bit to get equalized pupils. I'm chomping at the bit to get CLA. I'm hoping that we're close in CLA, and I'm hoping that I'm way under in equalized pupils and things get much better. I'm, I'm not sure that we're going to have the equalized pupil count by January 2nd. I hope we do. I really do. And I, if it's a good number, if the CLA is close and the equalized pupils goes up, it's going to make me feel a lot better about taking out that fund balance. Okay. Um, so you're projecting an actual decline in equalized people from FY19, or you're putting in as a placeholder? Yeah. I just made it a round number, and I didn't want to go up, so I went down. Um, by all stretches of my imagination, it should go up. It really should, but there's this weird thing on equalized pupils. They look at your two, they take your average daily membership over two years, and then they have all this waiting. Uh, like a high school kid is worth more than an elementary school kid, and a preschool kid's only worth 0.46. But uh, if you have kids that have ELL needs, they get a they get weighted heavier. If you have kids um, free and reduced high, then it gets weighted heavier. And then what happens is you have a total number statewide that's a lot more than the number of kids you actually have in the state. And then what the AOE does is it says, what do I have to multiply this by? to get it to drop down here. 
and they multiply everybody's equalized pupil by that equalizing ratio. And that's a scary thing, because I don't know whether that's 93 percent. So you can't do the math here now. I cannot do the math. There's no way, because I don't math. know what the equalizing yeah. ratio is. Yeah. Brad James Brad James does, Brad. yeah. 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 He, he does all the math. Right? <laughs> and, he's, no, all and in fairness to him, I can't really complain about him not giving us an equalized pupil count, because there mean. are schools that don't have their data in yet, because the statewide longitudinal data system is very challenging for you to feed your data into it and it has to be exactly precise the way it gets in it in order for it to work. Year it changed this year without any technical support for us to how to do it. Okay. So that's why I'm not sure when we're going to get that and what it's going to look like, but I'm really hopeful that I'm very um, pessimistic on that. Uh, let's see, what else? Hopefully pessimistic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Actually, Grace, um, can you remind me which fiscal year to Roxbury Montpelier have the same pre-CLA tax rate? How many, is it five? It wasn't five years, was it three years after the merger that the rates oh, go together? Oh, they were supposed to get together? I thought it was close to five. But probably it equalized. Was it? it was probably about the time that the um, merger yeah. incentive book uh, expired, which would have been about five years. But it's a 5% decrease, so that actual, that absolute number is getting smaller as their number goes down. So your tax, it's, it's, it's not a straight line, in other words. Right. And it's and it it would be getting there a lot quicker if there wasn't that five percent, mm -hmm. um, because you can see like the equalized is the real is the number you need to look at because everybody's CLA is different. So if you look at the equalized Rock or Montpelier's at like dollar almost dollar fifty, Roxbury dollar sixty five, that dollar sixty five would be considerably lower. It would be the same as Montpelier's. Um, I was Whenever, just trying to remember which fiscal year that they would be the yeah, same. And it, it is, but Ryan but also mathematically, it's not going to work that way because the monthly rate will keep going up, so they're going to meet in the middle. Sure. Right, and mathematically when that will happen <coughs> is whenever the merger incentive goes away because the math will tell you that the equalized rate will be identical when there is no um, incentive and there is no limit on the decrease. So in whenever that 6 goes to 4 to 2 and then hits 0, then... There's only going to, this chart will only have one cell right here. Mm -hmm. right. And so th by definition, in, in five years, they will be identical except for the CLA. Right. I'm not going to talk too much about this because it could change. I mean, Roxbury's number should be pretty close, except you know, the CLA is going to impact. So for Montpelier, you've got pupil count and CLA that are going to impact this. For Roxbury, you really just have the CLA that's going to impact this. And I did add on here at the bottom. Thank you. It is something to remind people that for in <laughs> Roxbury, for example, these impacts are a worst case scenario. This is for families that pay 100% of their taxes, um, education taxes, based on property value. Two thirds of the people don't. Two thirds of the people get an income sensitivity, so it'll be even less than this for most people. And all board members need to have that committed to memory because that's something that needs to be. The, the, the asterisk on every single conversation is two thirds of the people are not going to see this much increase. Right? Mm -hmm. um, non residential, I changed the tax rate based on the commissioner's uh, recommendation, but the other thing to remember here is this is not impacted by school budgets at all, period. Um, the outlook, so we'll spend a little bit of time on these next two slides and then we'll be done. So the big thing is that two cent rate decrease every year means if we're going to try to keep tax rates level, we would have to cut about two hundred fifty to two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars in expenses. Um, the enrollment in staffing, since they're both going up, and the enrollment is going up more than staffing, probably the spending for people should be pretty level. It's not a big impact. That means your tax—that's pretty much tax neutral because both are going up. Um, the expenditures that we know we're going to cut forty thousand dollars in grandfathering um, in next the next year 80 and then 80 and then it's done um, and wasn't that working about that two cents when we talked about the mergers the two cents goes away the also what we're paying in tuition yeah the the thing that's interesting is because we're seeing that huge drop in FY 20 there's less of a drop now in the other years so it's not that nice slope of like a hundred thousand yeah. a year it was like 200,000 and now 40, 80, 80, you know. Um, so 
so so far if you're doing if you're keeping track so far to absorb the 250 to 270 all we have is 40. Um, we could decrease these one-time facility costs for 87,000 but if we also have that fund balance and get rid of that that's tax neutral if we don't have the fund balance and we get to cut 87,000 well now that's another 87,000 towards the 250. Um, transportation aid is going to increase about probably only about 20,000 in FY21 but then 48,000 in FY22 because of adding um, Main Street busing. Um, bond expenditures are pretty level. We don't have to worry about absorbing a big one like we did this year because of the first year of bond principle. But as construction bond costs are going to go down every year, the Beamer's bond for retirement actually is structured so it goes up a little every year. So they're pretty much level. So the outlook is we have a lot of money to have to cut if we're going to keep the balance, um, taxes neutral. And we have maybe half of that if we take away the fund balance this year. Um, maybe a little more than half of that. Um, or probably right about a half of it. Um, budget summary. Can I skip a slide? No. Oh, no. There. The budget summary, I mean, that'll change whenever I get new data. Um, but the discussion points is the other big one. So I beat the first two bullets to death. We talked pretty considerably about the third bullet. Um, so really what I'm looking for is if you have any other thoughts or if you have any other thoughts about um, the public forum presentation. Uh, last year we had more edu a few education-centric slides, yeah. overview type of slides that we had thrown in there as well, things that aren't in my alley. Um, so we could look at maybe adding a few slides that are like that. Um, I will take out some slides, especially the ones that are like by, cat by, um, by cost category and put those in back up. I'll take the HR one and put it in back up. But uh, I'd open it up to you as far as what you'd like. I would um, say a couple of things. I think we should have a, a general slide about the merger, like maybe more of a mm -hmm. slide than a grant slide. In terms sure. of just overall, how's it going? How's it going? Mm -hmm. It's going you great. Mean how's, the <laughs> how's the finances going? <laughs> Well, and the operations both. too. Yeah. Both. Yeah. It's, well, connected. And I it's connected. Think it's connected. Yeah. And I think the finances though, so what's happening that by the way, we didn't have to pay for it kind of thing. I mean, I think people were worried that the merger would cost a lot of money for some of those Yeah. And I, I like having the like what do we do slides that are like we have four buildings, we have this many employees, we have this much you know, this is our payroll, this is our kids. You want that? Yeah. Do you guys agree? Like, well, I, I think no. that, like, just to ground remember, people in what we do. Well, remember, yeah. we talked about the big challenges for the year. We're going to be the mergers, equity, and one other thing. I don't remember what it was. Personalization. What was it? Personalization. It might have been. Yeah. So the question is, how how does the budget react to those three priorities? And that was something I think we did really well last year. Was how the budget kind of relate back. And if there was any way to do a cover sheet, you know, the, the, the merger, here's what, here's what we did, here's what's ahead, here's the budget impact. And then, and, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, you can keep it general. I know it's, I don't want you to dig up, like, create new research on this, but I think there needs to be educational context, as you were saying, some educational slides. I agree with that, too. But, yeah. I, but I also, like, I also just like the what we do context. To, you mean to ground, like, what when, we do as a school district, period? Like, when people show up and they're interested in learning about the budget, to ground them in, this is how big our organization is. Oh, this, so is this is where we scale educate people. This yeah. is the scale of what we do. Right? Not, not in huge that, detail. Just, 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 and and not know. only that, I still have people say to me, what are the grades at Rockford? Mm -hmm. um, when did our kids come? So that idea of, okay, Roxbury consists of these grades, then they come to Montpelier. It sounds like we've said it five million times, but I still have people ask me about it. And that's sort of how did the merger work? Yeah. You know, what actually happened? Oh, Roxbury now is taken four, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, and just thinking back to last year's presentation, I think we're a little, I recall we're a little heavy on it. There was, there was kind of a deep dive into a bunch of very kind of factual information on just what the schools look like. I think that could be mis yeah, I think I think that could be a I think it'd be a quick it's overview. Just we just got four yeah, four, four schools. Got four buildings. They have this yeah. many kids in the yeah, four hundred employees. Exactly. 
it's and, not a lot. It's just then, this um, is what we're talking about. Maybe a little more on on kind of vision and okay. what what drives the budget. What and how's yeah you know, how's the merger going? Kind of just a Under here's where we're at. Here's where we want to go. Everybody always asks me, "How are the kids getting here? Is that okay?" Because it was a question during the merger of transportation. Well, maybe yeah. instead of trying to get it, yeah, I think all that quick overview is good. I'm wondering though, how do we tie? Why this budget? What is it that? Why this budget is the budget it is? And what are you trying to do this year in the schools? What are you trying to do next year in the schools? And why this budget? How does that do that? <laughs> yeah, I think that's a direct connection and correlation, just as I kind of play it out, just without yeah. having much thought to it. But it's a, that question alone is a direct correlation to the two staffing pieces that we put in and alliance with the systems and structures that I was talking about in the soup report, that those positions are meant to build capacity in terms of systems and structures and what we're able to do. To it's dry. I yeah. know, it is dry. And I think maybe that's what you say, right? It's like, this is my first year, full year, mm -hmm. and what I'm trying to do is get everything organized, get everything, best practices, professionalism, build a good culture, yeah. you know, yeah. and say that. Which is not a lie. That's exactly yeah. what I'm but trying that's, to do. But that's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> well, that's good. The community <laughs> will feel good about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Know, oh, we got a strong leader yeah. who seems to understand systems. Yeah. Right? And those three things that you put in the report for program. this, for this uh, board meeting are those things yeah. that... I think people want to know, oh, we have a new superintendent, and by the way, she noticed that we need these things yeah. in yeah, order right. to do those things. And maybe part of that important. is we're not trying to be, we had a big year last year with the merger, like the, or this year with the merger. The we, we had, it's and been a bond, huge yeah. year, right? We had these two big things. Oh, that was the other thing, was execute the bond properly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we've gone through that. So great, now we've got, we wrestled that to the ground, but now we got to start looking at systems and culture and not try to be too ambitious in the coming year other than finish the things we started and get some professionalism and some systems in place. So we're gonna take a breather, we're not gonna you're not gonna see a new anything in this budget other than what you would hope we would be doing. Yeah. And maybe or that's the positive we've heard from the community. Right. And I think that's a positive statement. You're not seeing a map you know, new initiatives that are gonna be terribly sexy this year. It's or really good. Like well, there is one, right? But yeah, that's but just the beginning of the beginning of the yeah, beginning. beginning it's, just, right? it's just starting. Well, I, I think even that fits into an Dang approach it. of, look, I'm, you know. Responsive to the community. community. Yeah, responsive to the community. Not just responsive to the community, but, but you know, looking at systems and looking at, you know, how do we, how do we achieve educational ends by looking at what we have, looking at culture. And, you know, we're not, it's not a program, it's a study to see how can we, right. How can we implement a program? Right. Even that is not going to be a new initiative this year. It's just we're starting to get ready for. Yeah. It's out a systems there. approach. Yeah. yeah. So if you can say that in a way that makes people feel like that's exactly what this school district needs this year yeah. is that. So the yeah, other thing that might come up is, so how are we doing with that? Well, uh, you know, how's the construction? Even though uh, it doesn't the playground fit in here, it's going to come up. Yeah. Yeah. You know, playground. how's the playground? Where are we on track? Are we spending more than we thought we would? Are we, you know, all those questions. That transportation and Roxbury will definitely be three yeah, things. Yeah. Yep. Possibly snow days. <laughs> <laughs> Not really oh, yeah. budget related. I so that so one many up. questions. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> That's what the soup report was like. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know. It. It was they're ready awesome. for it. They'll ask it again. It's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere. Um, There's a certain number of people who are convinced we're going to have more snow days. And unfortunately, yeah. since oh, we had more snow before snow. Christmas, right. and we had it started like through. coming well, true. Okay. Right. Christmas, it's a yeah. cruel, cruel joke. I had to do two snow days before yeah. December. Oh, yeah. Yeah. First year. It was a cruel joke. <laughs> was a cruel joke. <laughs> so yeah. one thing that I think might be nice, Grant, would be to have like a basics of a school budget in Vermont, kind of like to explain like how the tax factors and fit into what happens to the budget because like if I came in not knowing anything about how it works in Vermont I would I would think okay your budget that you're making is like is the budget but then there's all the state things that affect what actually happens and what well I guess what happens to the tax rate 
So, some sort of, and I don't know where necessarily, but like something about like the breakdown of what happens. So we set the budget, and then this is this is what happens to get the tax rate. And I know you like the slides at the end do sort of address that, but not like in an overview sense. Do you know, does so that make sense? So you're looking for something uh, earlier that basically just talks about the education fund and how it, that yeah. works. Yeah. yeah, that. Good luck with it. I'll be glad yeah, to see you explain that before, in before seconds like, or less. Yeah, before no, like, people are sort of like all in the details. BPR has yes. spent like 10 years trying to educate Vermonters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. What if it was more of a, I, I, I like that. I, maybe it was more like a, as we build a budget in Montpelier, we have to remember that there are these five things that happen to us yeah. that yeah. come from the outside that are going to ultimately turn our, our dollars into a tax rate. And we don't get to control those, and we don't even know what they are yet. And then here they are, boom, 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 boom. Yeah, and I think there's still a lot of people out there that think that you get money based on the number of kids, you know, the old block grant mm -hmm. type yeah. mentality, which it, it's, it hasn't been like that for years. So. Maybe there is, you know, something I could put together that's at least like the basics, the very basics of, of you know, like how it works up front. You don't have to reinvent the wheel either. There are a couple of really good resources on yeah. this. I was just going to say, the VSBA put together a like cartoon thing for yeah. the Ed Fund last year. I watched it like 15 times when I was before I interviewed for you guys. Right. And I still don't understand. <laughs> 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 yeah, if but you don't put a clown nose on what you're doing it. that's something for you guys to know as a quick yeah. link yeah. to send people if they ask. Too. Like, here, try out this cartoon. I just think it would be awesome <laughs> if I could put a link to a cartoon in a budget briefing. I that know. Would be a first. <laughs> we could totally show that instead of you talking, right? Yeah. <laughs> See how long Here's it is. Down. Just, it's a totally crazy idea. Just you do it to what with it what you will, but I just had this thought that you could take the slide at the end, but just last year's as the first slide. Like, if you started with this and kind of briefly explained how this year's budget, that we are, where all these numbers we already know. Or like even that could sort of frame a little bit for, like, this is this year, these are these numbers that we didn't actually know. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. this is where we're starting, okay, now we're going to go through what's happening and then kind of end. That's a dense introduction. Yeah, well, I know, not, it's hard. That is the very first word out of your mouth. But or maybe, like, you know, maybe nice round numbers. Something you know, just some right. We need one of those honors the bill things for this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Schoolhouse yeah. Rock. School yes. 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 They're, they're actually like it. Public Assets Institute created it. Like, oh, it's, really? it's outdated now, but yeah, it's very similar to that. <laughs> it was like eight years ago. Well, I will think of something I can put together. I, obviously, you, it's hard to think about doing it in a less than like five slides, but I, I think it's something that we should try to boil down to just one slide. Yes. If I can do yes. it, and if somebody comes across something that, oh, this is perfect, then send it to me. Otherwise, I'll just start looking around and coming up with something on my own and see how we do. I think even just a quick overview, like, these things are really complicated. We don't control these, but here's just yeah. kind of. Here's what we don't control. Here's what we don't right. control, and mm -hmm. it's a lot. And the, yeah. You know, what you can do is you can have a handout that has the details. Uh, you know, you can give the really quick brief, and this is kind of how it works, but if you want more information on the table is, the sack of handouts we come home with. And that may be something you could get off of some right, already produced yes, resources. Yeah, yeah, I could put a slide together that has some links on it. Yeah. The cartoon link. The cartoon link. Yeah. I think it's Any fun. other thoughts? I think it's okay if it's dry. People don't come if they're not budget people. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and we don't have 100 people that show up for this, in case you yeah. noticed. Well, I think just, yeah, you know, I think the point is to communicate what we're doing and why, not to make it sexier than it is. But if that's true, then I think we have to lead with what are we trying to get done. Exactly. Right. What are we doing and why, and then there's the budget for it. I, I do think what Steve's getting at, though, and we've brought this up at numerous meetings before, slight digression here, which is without a real vision statement where we've involved the community to really iron out what do we want from our schools, I think we're going to continue to have trouble. With these, with this type of communication, I think our approach this time is great. I don't. I disagree. Right. I, th I think we could have a vision 
session until we're blue in the face, and I don't think it would make us really okay. resources. Okay. How about this? Well, like, here, here are our goals as a district. If we have right. our, our like three to five goals as a district, this is how this budget is helping us meet them. We don't really have We're working on that. Right. 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 That's what we're, I'm saying. And I think that's what we say is, look, you know, if it was three years from now, it would be like, we all know that we set these as our goals. We all know that this is where this district's heading, and this is what we want to achieve. Here's what we're doing this year. Right, we don't have that. So this year it's, y'all know we're a brand new district. Y'all know we don't have any goals yet. So in, lo in lieu of that, we're going to get a really solid institution. We're going to build a really solid institution. I know. We're going to build a really solid institution that can act, that can build on that, right? And that we're going to finish this disruption we just finished and make ourselves strong. But Libby has these three goals she gave us today. Well, we Great. can, we can Use them. I'm going to say the royal we because it's me, right? So we have a new district, a new superintendent, who's leading a leadership team yes. relatively new. We need some learning to, you know, we need some time and we appreciate the community giving us that kind of time as we build the structures we need to in order to move more efficiently for, you know, in, in all kinds of learning. And that we will get there, right? But it's it's on my shoulders, so that's that's what we're gonna go with, right? It's not your shoulders, it's, my, it's our shoulders to get those goals in place and to know exactly what we need to do. And you guys to say either yay or nay to those goals. And it's always, it's been a challenge for you know, going on 13 years for me to try to build a budget that really links to action plans and links to this and links to that because the fact of the matter is 70 some odd percent of your budget is salaries and benefits for the people that you've got. So, I mean, the majority of our money is going to be for doing just the everyday stuff. And we're always going to be able to call out a few things but it's never going to seem very significant in terms of the total percentage of budget. You know, like, hey, we're going to do this $22,000 world language immersion, which is 0.1% of the budget. Uh, you know, because you just never can get that big chunk and say, well, 20% of the budget is for this goal and 20% is that. No, 70% of it is just to have the people come back. You know, um, but seven, but, but what hard. percentage of my tax increase is for maintenance versus initiative? And I mean, and, and as a taxpayer, you know, if I see my tax are going up a hundred bucks, you know, are they going up a hundred bucks because you guys are doing a whole bunch of new stuff? Are they going up a hundred bucks because you're just trying to pay the bills? And I think the answer this year is mostly we're just paying some bills, and and it's and that's not and that's why the tax increase is small, and you're not seeing a lot of huge new initiatives out of this. this Although is a we're adding a person, and we're adding busing, and, and we can set. talk about why we felt that was yeah. important. And yeah. I should say that, right? Yeah. yeah. And isn't, isn't it at this point accurate to say that most of the tax increases because of the CLA? Um, More than, I mean, you, you could say, well, equalized pupils right now is causing a little bit of a problem, but CLA, yeah, CLA is probably Good portion. four cents of the six, so yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. it's... It's complicated, the problem is right. it's just complicated. It's all within that range of... There's not a lot you can do. Right. And that's the, explaining the CLA in 30 seconds is not easy. Well, here, it's better. It's two cents is because we lost two cents of tax initiative or merger initiative. Right. Mm -hmm. And then four cents CLA. Yeah. Six yeah. cent increase. Uh -huh. I mean, there's other places where we gained because mm -hmm. the yeah, yield yeah, went up. But ups and downs. Mean, but right. <coughs> it's, it's okay. I mean, I think the message is this is not a year for a new merger, for a new bond, for a new anything. Other than, yeah, I mean, take care and of it's a, And one yeah. can say it's you're a good thing future, because yeah. you're paying yeah. the most on your bond so this year. Yeah. And we knew that, so we're not doing other big things. Yeah, well, I, I think that's totally fair. And yeah. I think people might be relieved. It's like we've got yeah. new administration, new district, <laughs> and, a huge, and the biggest bond in history. Okay, <laughs> let's take a breather. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, no, Even Steve I, is saying take a breather. Don't underestimate how people, how excited people will be about busing and a meaningful step forward on world language. Yeah. And a new superintendent. I mean, those those two things have been. Rockstars. I've been hear, well, I've been hearing about those since I've been on the board. Yes, that's before. true. That's true. And the playground. And the playground. And the playground. So those are pretty sexy things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Flashy. Maybe what I should do is, you know, that slide that shows by category all the increases and decreases in the fonts about four, you know, size four. Mm -hmm. Maybe what I should have is more of a, have that more as a 
you know, here's this slide that goes into all the real details if you want to look at it later. But in front of that, maybe I should just talk about the budget increase is X, and here are the big pieces. Yeah, you know, that's so perfect. That it's, yeah. That's you great. know, size 12 font instead of size 4 font. Yeah. Um, so I could look at trying to do that too. Kind of prime them for that page. Yeah. And now how many slides you want, right, after you do it. I think you've done a great job with this. Yeah, oh, great. yeah. no, it's fantastic. Thank As you. usual. Yeah. The, yeah. Appreciate it. Let's we'll see what well. we can do to oh, make it a little better. Yeah, this is your third year of this here? This is my third year. Yeah, and all three have been fantastic. They really have been. Even though the slides are endless, I love all the information. <laughs> <laughs> Not that endless. All right, what can we do next? Uh, that was the, uh, I'm just going to assume that our board discussion on budget, which, and well, we skipped over public comment. Here. Um, I think we're done. Could, could I add a 30 second thing about my trip to the uh, career center? Sure. Um, I think we will. As were the legislators to go to the open house of the career center, which in Barry, which I did go to, and what was interesting to me is that um, besides visiting all the places, um, at the end they gave this little presentation which explained that Barry High School wants more of the space the career center's in, so the career center has to go somewhere else, and. The Career Center wants to go somewhere Well, else. I'm getting to that. Yes. <laughs> so the Career Center's vision is that they'll build a new school. And it will be a whole high school, 9 through 12. So students that attend the Career Center will enter in ninth grade and go four years there. They won't come to another high school. That was interesting for me to hear. Um, I did say, okay, Montpelier is different. We've been gaining population. The rest of Vermont is losing population, and you would be acquiring that population from those high schools that are losing that. And I was saying to Grant, they had the great answer, which was, it's not losing. We're not taking. We're discussing the entire educational career of all of these children, which is, of course, true. But I just thought you ought to know that's what they're thinking about. Oh, they'd like, now imagine how much, talk about budget, imagine how much it would cost just to build a whole new high school. And yeah, then think about how much it would cost to build a tech school. We don't have any like they're proposing in Vermont. They have them in Connecticut, Massachusetts. And they have, as far as I can figure out, they don't understand how they would get the money they thought perhaps the state could give them. So it's a publicly funded competitive high school with, with other overlapping districts, effectively. I mean, it, it creates a real problem for public education. Public, well, public funding of education. Their answer, of course, would be if you're looking at the whole education of the student, yeah. wouldn't you want? Well, that's the argument for school choice in general, is just student-focused, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. community-focused. Yes, like that's, that that's not a systems approach. No, it's not. No. So you have, to, you have to consider the system, and the, 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 not just the welfare of the students who choose to attend there, but the welfare of every student has to be balanced. So it has to be, it's a tough one. Not I've been I've been keeping Jim in the loop. Sorry, Steve. No, go for I've it. been keeping Jim relatively in the loop when I get new information about this particular thing. I don't think I'd be speaking out of turn if I said that there's a little rogue behavior going on. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> and and the mere fact that that's what I was saying about building a new building and a whole new school costs a lot of money, and there's and I don't want you all to think that that is coming that. from the board of directors, school board of directors from Barry or. Um, colleagues of boardmanship, however you want to say. Uh, what's the governing body of the of that school? Um, there is, so I sit on kind of a commission that is leaders from every sending district, um, and the principal there, Penny. And that governs it. Um, the very board technically is there. Oh. Is their employee? I mean, they they're under a very contract and, and they're. Kind but of decisions there. like that would be made by Barry. 
Um, not decisions mm -hmm. of that nature. It couldn't be made simply by Barry unless Barry was funding it totally. Um, because right. because in essence, that is a shared, exactly, that's a shared entity, even though it falls under the jurisdiction of, of the Barry Board of Directors. So they would need to, to do something that scale, they would need to get the... They need to get you guys on board. Well, they right, they would need to get each district to approve the new agreement or whatever. Where does their funding come from? It comes from the different schools. Yeah, so Can I have to pull this back just a bit? This is not an agenda right. item. Yeah. And we're getting, I think, beyond an update in what? terms of yeah. We could have it as an agenda, especially if it moves forward. But I think if we get, if, if this is something we need to react to, and it may at some point be. I think it's too I early to react. I, react. Um, react to I think it's too early to react to, which is why I, yeah. I kind of wanted to. I move yeah. we go from non-update to, yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>